Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar on economic and environmental opportunities for woody biomass here in Maryland. An extraordinary opportunity for us to share the latest science and information about Maryland's clean energy future. My name is Gary Allen, and I'm the president of the Maryland Forestry Foundation, and we want to welcome you to this series of webinars on biomass energy. Let's get started with a few technical details so that we're all on the same page at the same time as we move through the program. Let's practice a polling question to get a little bit of better information about the size of the group that's joining us today. I hope many of you are signed on and not having any difficulty with what for many of us is a fairly new technology. You notice you can use the chat box for technical support. These sessions are being recorded and will be posted online later on at the same website where you were able to sign on and look for your invitation and register for this program. Later on, we hope to have time for questions at the end of our uh, webinar and all of them as a matter of fact, and we'll use a question and answer feature on the program uh, in order to handle that conversation. And we'll introduce a couple polling questions in the context of our program in order to give people the opportunity to interact more frequently with the program. So how many of you are with us today? And let's move on to a second question, which gives us an idea of who we are as a group. So you'll notice that we've pre-identified some options and we'd like very much for you to take a few seconds to see how you fit within this overall matrix of those that registered for the program. We're quite excited because over a hundred folks have joined us for today's uh, webinar and several hundred for the entire series. So. And it gives us a lot of encouragement about the broad interest in topics like the ones we're talking about today. This program is merely the beginning of several. Here it is on June 2nd, but on June 9th, we'll be talking about the economic framework for supporting forest conservation with woody biomass energy. And again on the June 16th program, the 23rd of June, and we'll conclude on July the 7th. We hope that those of you who've joined us today will register for these other programs and join us for the entire series. But remember, these will be posted online afterwards so that we can continue to encourage others to join us who weren't able to sign in for these particular dates. It's a part of a larger series and you can earn continuing forestry education credit from the Society of American Foresters for attending these sessions. And at the end of today's session, we'll open a survey page for each of you on your browser after leaving the webinar. And we hope that you'll take the time to submit the form to ensure that we have your correct information for the continuing education credit and that we can follow up with you for further information on the topics presented here today. This program is being offered in association with a a uh, project sponsored by the Rural Maryland Council on spurring fossil-free uh, biomass energy. And it's brought to you by the Maryland Forestry Foundation, the Maryland Clean Energy Center in partnership with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, our Sustainable Forestry Council with funding from the Maryland Agricultural Education and Rural Development Assistance Fund. We're very grateful for the Rural Maryland Council's help in supporting this program. And we have enjoyed their support for other work that we've done. And this is an example of some of the work they're doing to help restore uh, and support economic empowerment in Maryland's rural areas. Today's program has a great lineup of speakers as do all of our workshops. And at the end of the program, as I say, you have time for question and answer. But remember that the questions of the panelists can be submitted by as the Q and A function on your screen. So take a look at the screen if you've not had a chance. We won't be entertaining questions as a part of each presentation. But looking now at session one, 
Maryland has an untapped supply of energy that could diversify and expand our renewable energy portfolio, help local economies and maintain, we think, and improve forest health without increasing carbon emissions. And that's woody biomass. In this series of webinars, we wanna share with you the latest science, listen to the concerns that many of you may have about the issues that will be raised here and address the challenges that we've previously identified have been shared with us in the planning of this program to meet Maryland's clean energy future and to support the sustainable management of our forest resources for Maryland's nearly 200,000 private forest landowners. In this webinar series, we hope that you'll gain a broader understanding of what is woody biomass and how it can be used to produce a renewable energy resource here in Maryland and how that can complement other renewables and an overall renewable portfolio strategy for Maryland's clean energy future. Of course, there are pros and cons to every energy choice we make. And some of these are tough choices for a variety of reasons. And we've been wrestling with these for over 20 years now here in Maryland. But Maryland has been a leader in examining the questions and addressing these issues. We hope in this case, another opportunity arises that we can again be a leader in how this particular opportunity evolves to address our clean energy future. To help us introduce this topic and our series, we've been uh, fortunate to have the Secretary of Maryland's Department of Natural Resources Secretary Jean Hadaway Rico. The good news is she was born and raised right here in Maryland in Talbot County. And her professional experience includes work in this area previously, where she worked for the Maryland Department of Environment's Air and Radiation Management Administration and the National Audubon Society. So she brings a really balanced set of perspectives to the work today that we're involved in. Since in two, from 2004 to 14, she served in the Maryland House of Delegates, representing an Eastern Shore County and worked on a variety of issues, including economic and environmental justice programs and the work like we're talking about today. But in 2014, uh, 2014, she joined the Hogan administration to serve as Deputy Chief of Staff for the Governor, advising on issues involving natural resources, agriculture, energy, and the environment. But today she joins us as Madam Secretary, and so I'm pleased to ask her to help welcome you to this extraordinary webinar series. Madam Secretary. Well, thank you, Gary, very much for that kind introduction. And I just want to say that um, the Maryland Forestry Foundation is a really important partner to DNR. So we appreciate all the work that you're doing. And I'm really pleased and honored to be joining today for the first webinar series on woody biomass in Maryland. Um, as Gary mentioned, I worked for the Maryland Department of the Environment. And as part of my job there, I helped write a white paper on what type of renewable energy sources could possibly work well in Maryland once we deregulated our utility industry. And in my first legislative session, we passed a renewable portfolio standard for the first time in Maryland and spent a great deal of time talking about what energy sources to include. And of course, now we know that qualifying biomass was one that was successful and a really important component for renewable energy in our state. And then um, as an Eastern Shore native, of course, it is um, very obvious how interconnected our economy and our environment is when it comes to forestry in the state of Maryland. So we certainly appreciate um, that interconnectedness. So how do we enhance woody biomass in Maryland? Um, we know that biomass is being used successfully in many European countries. It's also being used throughout the United States, particularly in the Northeastern region. And it's a proven technology that Maryland could definitely benefit from. And we know that Maryland is well poised to be a part of the solution. In fact, Maryland has enough volume to feed the existing industry for over 100 years, not including new growth. And in terms of sustainability, less than 1% of Maryland's forests are harvested annually. Maryland can definitely provide a predictable supply. And this is really important when you consider the disruptions that typically occur in the global supply chain. 
So why does DNR care about woody biomass and forestry? Um, well, there are many benefits from the biomass industry that tie directly to DNR's mission because the biomass market requires sustainable forestry practices. And so carbon sequestration, improved wildlife habitat and biodiversity for a variety of wildlife and forest health are all benefits that we gain from a healthy biomass market. The same management practices also result in healthier forests that are more resilient to droughts and climate stressors. And this is supported by the fact that forestry is a key component of both our watershed implementation plan and our Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act strategy in Maryland. And so looking at a path forward for the state, DNR is actively working with the Western Maryland RCND, the Department of Commerce, the Tri-County Councils, and other partners on an EDA grant that we won to develop an economic adjustment strategy. And in developing that EAS, we will be able to identify a path forward for Maryland, including identifying right-sized projects with locally sourced mixes, tapping into the existing forest industry supply chain and identifying ways to enhance it, and then creating a sustainable market for small diameter wood. Again, all things that benefit our environment at the same time. And I wanna take a moment to talk about our staff at DNR and the importance of the role of our forestry staff. They are extremely important in this equation, particularly due to the fact that 70% of our state's forest resources are privately owned. So our staff interactions with private landowners are absolutely key. Just last year, our forest service staff worked with private landowners across the state to plant over 276,000 seedlings, and they contributed to the planting of 250,000 more trees. They also reached over 5,800 people through 23 events just on forest buffers alone. And they're providing assistance to all size landowners. So whether it's planting one tree through our Marylanders plant trees coupons, whether it's a couple of dozen trees through our backyard buffers program, or whether it's helping landowners manage acres and acres of forests through healthy forest, healthy waters, through lawn to woodland, or our woodland incentive programs, our staff is active actively working with nonprofit partners throughout the state to support private landowners and we are actively looking for potential projects in the woody biomass arena that can help. So in closing I just want to reiterate that the Department of Natural Resources is completely committed to sustainable forestry in Maryland and we really appreciate the opportunity to participate in the webinar today to share ideas and to explore opportunities to expand the use of woody biomass in our state. And we're looking forward to continuing our work with all of the partners that are present here today to accomplish our economic and environmental goals that I know we all share. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you very much, you. Secretary. Really appreciate the opportunity of sharing this webinar with you and your lead off comments, very helpful. Our first presenter is Catherine Frenzold. Catherine is the president and CEO of Debtail Partners. For those of you who have had the opportunity to see the white paper that was provided available for presentation in preparation for this webinar, Debtail Partners is the author of that white paper. Catherine is their president and CEO and she's been a forester for over nearly a quarter of a century. Uh, she has experience as the lead aug author, auditor pardon me, for our forest certification assessments, having served both on audit teams for industrial, tribal, public, and family public forest lands. She's participated in the standard setting process for the FSC process as a member of the environmental uh, and external review panel of the FSC, pro FSI program, I should say, and served on a technical committee for the Sustainable Biomass Partnership. She's been deeply involved in the sustainability aspects of forest management throughout her entire career. She served as the chair of the Minnesota Society of American Foresters, was appointed to the Minnesota Forest Resources Council in 2002 and again in 2019, and served on the advisory board 
for one of the nation's foundation on vital forest, vital communities initiative. She served on the boards of the Minnesota Environmental Partnership and many other activities in her own state. And I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to work with her on this series. I wanna introduce Catherine Frensold and her presentation. Excellent. Catherine. Thank you very much, Gary. I am very happy to be here. And uh, Monique, I believe you have the slides and can bring up the slides and, and drive those. Thank you, Monique. I appreciate your help. So as Gary mentioned, I'm going to provide a summary of Biomass 101 and provide a summary of uh, the white paper that Dovetail Partners prepared on behalf of the Maryland Forestry Foundation. Next slide, please. Just to provide a little bit of background on Dovetail Partners, we are a Minneapolis-based uh, environmental think tank nonprofit. Um, and um, we, one of the things that's unique about Dovetail is we're not an uh, advocacy organization per se. I mean, to the extent we advocate for well-informed environmental decision making. That's our position. And so we work on a variety of environmental uh, related issues, land use, and um, we aim to provide information to inform decision making. Next slide, please. At our website, you can find some of the other papers that we've done over the years that are relevant to this topic. And I invite you to visit our website and all of those papers are available to download and share and inform on some of these other aspects of bioenergy, circular economy, uh, climate change, many of the other related topics as well. Next slide, please. So in the white paper, there were several key questions that are addressed in great detail within the white paper. Um, and I just wanna to touch on those five questions today. We'll talk a little bit about the potential effect of woody biomass markets on harvests of forests and forest health. We'll talk about greenhouse gases, carbon impacts of biomass energy, uh, the alternative uses of small diameter wood, and also the incentives, the existing uh, platform policy framework within Maryland to protect forest resources within the state. Next slide. First things first, what are we talking about with biomass? And I don't mean to be simplistic. I know many of the people on this webinar um, are deeply versed in biomass, but I think it is helpful to make sure we're using language and, and speaking clearly and understanding each other in our conversations. So in the broadest sense, biomass is any organic matter that can be burned, utilized for energy. Bioenergy systems um, within the white paper and I think within these conversations in Maryland, the goal is to include both con consideration of both electricity power production uh, for bioenergy systems as well as thermal energy production, such as the pr production of heat, thermal energy for our homes, businesses, or institutions, public or private facilities. So looking at bioenergy systems both for electricity and power, but also for thermal heat energy production. Um, and biomass fuels can come from a wide range of resources, waste wood, wood chips, residues, pellets. There's a, quite a range of materials that can be included within the conversation and also within the research. And at the end of the day, what we're examining here is how woody biomass can be renewable, sourced locally, and reduce carbon emissions and other impacts. I think the introdu introduction from uh, the secretary is very helpful in terms of framing up why we're having this conversation and asking these questions. Next slide, please. So this is, you know, rather than a list and a glossary terms, these are images of woody biomass energy. And I wanna walk through these because even, I mean, here in the US and as uh, the secretary mentioned globally, we're getting into a pretty good track record of woody biomass energy systems. And we're starting to really see which materials are being fed into these systems. A decade ago, there was speculation around you know, how the market might react, but we're starting to get really good insight into terms of which materials are being utilized, utilized in these energy systems. So if we start in the upper left, um, what you're looking at in that upper left picture is a sawmill, a lumber, a lumber mill. And you see in that sawmill, that what re results from lumber processing is sawdust. And oftentimes these in, will be referred to as residuals. And so they're residuals from the primary manufacturing industry, whether it's sawdust, shavings, bark, but the materials that are the, you also hear these materials referred to as byproducts of the forest industry. But residuals, byproducts, sawdust, um, 
coming from sawmills are, have in, become an increasingly important part of our bioenergy systems. We are seeing these raw materials going into much of our wood pellet production, especially in the Southeast US. And so this raw material has become a key part of evaluating the environmental impacts and energy impacts uh, of, of bioenergy systems. So those are residual sawmill residues. It, there's a couple different terms that are used, but that's what we have, the byproducts from the primary industry. The next picture to the right is an image of small diameter logs in a softwood management system. And so these are, you know, as the secretary spoke about, small diameter materials where we've seen some of the markets for those materials fluctuate and not be as strong as they were in the past. So many regions are looking to strengthen those markets. So these types of intermediate treatments can be more economical. We need these treatments in some regions to reduce wildfire risk, improve forest health for many different reasons. Uh, so removing small diameter material and utilizing those economically can be an important part of forest management. The next picture to the right, we're showing in that urban tree removals. So this happens to be after a storm event, but also we know insect and disease outbreaks, invasive species, uh, those kinds of things can drive the, the need to remove woody debris from our urban areas and bioenergy systems can utilize some of that material. Just below that is an image of a thinning operation. This happens to be a biomass energy thinning uh, in Finland, this is the same forest as you see in that small diameter picture, but just showing again those thinning operations, low impact equipment that can be used to remove a percentage of the material and then allow the other the trees that are left to grow for those trees to become higher value saw timber material is one of the goals of this type of thinning operation. Next picture is in the middle there on the bottom, waste wood. Uh, we do see a fair amount of pallets when they can no longer be recycled and repaired to continue to be reused within, the, within shipping, uh, then these materials also have to be disposed of and there is an opportunity to utilize those in energy production. The last image on the bottom left is uh, what is oftentimes re referred to as resid residues, excuse me. The top picture, residuals, is oftentimes what we hear from the primary industry. That picture below it is often called Res residues when we're talking about the small diameter branches and tops that come out of the forest during management. So that it can get a little confusing, residuals, residues, and that's why I think it's important to kind of just put a few of those terms on the table. But this is the broad spectrum of the materials that we actually see going into energy markets. Which materials will end up in these energy markets depends upon local conditions, availability, the supply, other competing markets, a bunch of factors, but this is, this is a bit of a snapshot of the range of materials that we're talking about with woody biomass. Next slide, please. So let's talk about some of the major conclusions from the white paper. And as I've not, I mean, the white paper has a, a, quite a long list of references, citations, all of the details. I'm not going to get into that today. I simply want to focus on the conclusions, the findings. Um, you know, what, what we drew from uh, review of the research. So the first area that we looked at was market effects and really asking that question, uh, how might forest biomass, woody biomass markets affect forest health, forest harvesting rights? It, uh, and what we know is that, as, as we heard in the introduction as well, the biomass markets can support improved forest sustainability. And they can do that in a bunch of different ways. One is if they utilize some of these low value materials, small diameter materials where markets have weakened and therefore it's no longer economical to remove those materials and manage the forest uh, for those benefits. Biomass markets can strengthen those opportunities and support forest sustainability. Biomass markets can also directly reduce waste, whether it's waste coming as a byproduct from the sawmill, waste from our urban areas, whatever it is, biomass markets can directly reduce waste. Markets for biomass, what we're also seeing, and it's, it's in the research and we're seeing it in the field, in practice, in regions where biomass markets have most, uh, are most developed, we're finding that markets for biomass in general, they're not strong enough, they, they don't provide enough of a financial incentive to, to drive the harvesting of higher value trees. We do predominantly see lower value materials, small diameter trees, waste materials going into these markets. They do not offer a strong enough financial incentive to compete with the higher value markets where larger long-lived trees would be, would be directed. So we do see the market 
separating out these materials based upon those values. That does vary depending on the particular markets in a particular region, but that is what we're seeing in practice and supported within the research. And so one of the interesting things that comes out of this, again, supported within the research, is that there's evidence that biomass markets, in what we're, and part of it is when you see diversified, strong forest product markets in general, including biomass markets, that one of the responses that we see in terms of the impact to the forest is that forest inventory increases as fiber demands and those fiber markets are strengthened. And when, when I talk about forest inventories, I'm talking about forest areas, the size, the number, the volume of trees in the forest. And so we've seen this response in regions uh, with strong biomass markets, that forest area and forest inventories are increasing in those regions. And there's, what the research talks about is really two reasons for this. Um, one is when demand grows, you know, prices rise, and so landowners position themselves to participate in those markets. And we'll look at those prices, and if, if that trend um, looks stable, they'll, they'll try and optimize their harvesting and, and participate in that marketplace opportunity. As we heard in the introduction, you know, the predominance of private land ownership is one of the reasons this, uh, this relationship is really strong. The second thing is that, of course, that market demand, the rising prices, that financial incentive can go right back into forest management, replanting forest and, and tree regeneration. So you see that positive feedback loop into management. Next slide, please. The other two things we see when we look at the market effects of uh, bio, woody biomass energy markets is that um, where markets are weak, where there aren't markets for small diameter trees, there is evidence of tree mortality increasing because forest management activities decline. There isn't that economic incentive to remove those small diameter trees, harvesting activities decline. The most um, visible example of this relationship is of course in the Western US uh, where we've seen weakening in markets, uh, increased forest mortality, increased wildfire risk, um, so there is that kind of relationship that can also occur where markets are not robust and where there aren't those financial incentives for managing the removal of small diameter trees. Lastly, uh, another finding from the research, again, this relates back to private land ownership, is that forest income potential, the uh, opportunity for private landowners to make to have income based upon growing trees and selling into forest product markets is one of the strongest deterrents to selling their land for other uses, whether it's um, that land being converted into development or even converting it into an agricultural land use or some other land use other than growing trees. So forest income potential is an important driver for keeping forests as forests on the landscape. Next slide, please. So that's, you know, those are some bullet points on some slides. I wanna show a couple of graphics. I am a forester, so I love maps. I, I'm guessing there's a few other people that know that stereotype of foresters that we believe everything can be expressed through a map. But I just wanna talk a little bit about forest area and forest health. So, you know, if we watch the headlines, we know that globally the change in forest area is pretty complicated and a mixed bag. Uh, this is global analysis that's done about every five years. And what you're looking at here is annual change in forest area across the world by country. The countries shown in white are generally stable forest area. Countries shown in red have declining forest area. Countries shown in green have increasing forest area. So we, the good news is over the years, we've started to see uh, more forest area stabilization. Um, but we do see a lot of nations where forest area continues to de decline, uh, as has been the pattern for a very long time. The majority of that decline is associated with agricultural expansion, conversion of forest areas to uh, agricultural commodities. Uh, we do see an uh, increasing number of countries that are turning green on this map as well. Uh, China has a very aggressive uh, afforestation, reforestation policy. And you also see on this map that the U.S. has been gaining forest area in the recent monitoring as well. So I wanna talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. So this is a map showing forest areas in the US today. Um, and as is noted there, the darkest green counties have seen a 50% increase in the percentage of forest land area just in the last few decades. So we have seen forest area expand in this country. And this can be very surprising in some ways. There's a bunch of drivers behind this. 
if you want to further examine what's going on with forests and forest cover in this country, I would encourage you to visit this usaforest.org website. Much of the information that they provide is map based like this and you can really drill into the details, but also the white paper examines this. Next slide, please. One thing that is driving this, this increased forest cover is the direct relationship between forest land uses and our forest industry. Um, this is, this is uh, where we're seeing pellet mills um, around the country. And it's not a surprise, you know, our pellet mills do correspond with our forest areas. And so there is a relationship between where we have forest-based uh, enterprises and where we have forest cover in this country. Next slide, please. And as was mentioned in the introduction, another driving factor here to consider is the forest land ownership. This shows forest land ownership across the country, the lighter green color being private ownership and the darker green being public ownership. And I, I apologize if the uh, audio is not coming through uh, well. Thank you for pausing the video. Hopefully that will, will help stabilize things. Um, and as was mentioned, uh, the uh, private ownership is quite dominant in Maryland and nationwide. Private owners represent the majority of our forest land. And on an annual basis, about 90% of the timber harvest in the United States each year comes from private forest lands. So there is this direct relationship between our wood supply, our forest cover, and private land ownership. Next slide, please. So let's go on to the next uh, question within the white paper, and this, gets, this is looking at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. As was mentioned in the introduction, I mean, one of the major drivers, the primary mechanism by which woody biomass provides us this near-term, nearly immediate benefit is by the reduction of the greenhouse gas emissions that would be associated with the use of fossil fuels. One of the most recent examinations of this uh, looked at over 900 different scenarios and found the reductions uh, in comparison to production of electricity from fossil fuels that the greenhouse gas emission reduction is between 50 and 68 percent. And I would note that this recent, this most recent, this recent study uh, specifically was uh, including the impacts of transatlantic wood pellet shipment and, and found that even in the case where we're shipping wood pellets all the way to the UK to be used in electric electricity production, still you see a 50 to 68 percent reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions. That study also found that with wood pellet production, the, the largest component of emissions do come from the production of the wood pellets. Compressing the material and producing a wood pellet is actually the largest portion of the emissions and the transatlantic shipment is a second to that. It's not, it's, um, it's a very interesting study. It's detailed in the white paper if you're interested. But beyond that near term uh, benefit and impact with woody biomass over the longer term, you know, something that is so unique about using woody biomass and, and a renewable material is that the benefit continues as forests are regrown, trees are regrown, and carbon is sequestered on the landscape so that, that you have this net reduction of greenhouse gases over time as we have a, a renewable resource. And the, the other point here is, you know, um, in years past, there was a lot of speculation, like I said, about what materials would actually go into a woody biomass market. And what we're seeing in practice, as I mentioned, the markets are really sorting themselves out. And so really a small diameter, fast growing, or, you know, short lived kind of, or, or you know, uh, trees that are reproduced and regenerate on a short cycle. That's really what we're seeing going into um, woody biomass systems. And in general, what, what we mean by that is that the materials are less than 15 years old or less than 15 year replacement cycle, and many times much lower than that. Seven years is also a common benchmark. So those are the general types of materials that we're seeing and the, the return um, in terms of uh, carbon recapture on those materials. Next slide, please. And so in the white paper, there's several comparisons. This is a, a chart just showing greenhouse gas savings, uh, referencing a, a heat boiler system as well as electricity. So the, the brown bars across the top are what we're measuring against. So that, that heat oil boiler system would be that horizontal bar. That's the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. The electricity grid is that, that, that brown line below that. And then across the bottom are all kinds of different biomass fuel sources. 
And so what you're seeing on those bars um, is the brown portion of the bar are the greenhouse gas emissions associated with that fuel type. And the blue portion is the gap, the, the, the avoided emissions, the gap between the baseline boiler or the electricity get grid and that alternative fuel source. So the, the blue represents the greenhouse gas savings. And you can see that, I mean, this paper analyzed, I don't remember how many dozens of different fuels. And these are just some that are relevant to our discussion in terms of forest-based fuels. But you can see there's a significant difference in terms of emissions. And notably, um, when we look on the far right, what, the far right last two columns where you don't see any brown, that's, um, those are the use of what are called non-tradable biomass fuels, truly waste materials, not, um, and, and the thing, with carbon accounting around waste materials, all of the carbon emissions are attributed to the primary material rather than to the waste material. So that's why the accounting for those last two elements includes no emission because with car carbon accounting protocols, the emissions are associated with the driver behind those materials uh, and not with the byproducts. Next slide, please. So if we continue to look a little bit at carbon impacts um, a little bit further, as, as Gary mentioned as well, you know, there are always trade-offs and differences and, and so the, act, the, the specific impacts of any given system will depend upon the material being used, the technology, those factors. So it's, it's, you can't generalize too much. You know, when you get into the details, that's when you can quantify the specific trade-offs uh, and impacts. But what we can generalize about is that in general, using residues or residuals, whichever word you prefer, but using residues and residuals, waste material, low value materials, or biomass that comes from sustainably managed forests. Those types of sources, when they are utilized in highly efficient combined heat and power systems, you know, best, best state-of-the-art technology, that's how we get our greatest carbon benefit, especially when it's compared to a non-renewable fossil fuel-based system. So those are the types of materials that provide the greatest benefit, and that's the kind of technology you want to be looking at if you want to get uh, the win-win best possible outcome. Next slide, please. But it goes beyond carbon. Carbon is certainly of critical importance um, and great urgency, but it also is important to note that biomass substitution for fossil fuels is also a strategy for reducing other types of emissions and pollutants. Um, you know, whether it's things that impact air quality, human health, uh, you know, reducing the risk of acid rain, these, these are other things, other benefits that can come from shifting away from fossil fuels, including you know, reducing our emissions of lead. I mean, these types of materials are very harmful for our environment and um, are also associated with a fossil fuel-based energy system and can be reduced with biomass energy use. Next slide, please. And this, this chart is showing that importance of technology. Um, when we look at old wood boiler types, and, and when it, this says old, I mean, this is really just, um, you know, even in the early 2000s, there were some boiler types uh, prior to some of the uh, certifications and, and other systems that came in place. But bottom line, the modern technology can make a significant difference in the types of emissions that we see from these systems. So some of the things we may have seen in generation past um, just aren't relevant. Uh, it's just the measures and the analysis is completely different when you look at some of the new technologies. And that's why it's important to be using the best available technologies. Next slide, please. Um, one of the uh, uh, questions in the white paper was also looking at, okay, if we didn't use small diameter trees for woody biomass, what might those materials go into instead? And what, the, what might be the environmental or carbon impacts of that? Um, and this is discussed at length in the white paper. Um, and I, it's a, it, again, it's one of those things where it depends on a whole bunch of factors. Um, so I, if this is of interest, I would encourage you to look at the details in the white paper. But bottom line is, you know, carbon storage in any type of alternative material is going to depend on all kinds of factors, the lifespan of that product. And when we calculate this carbon sequestr sequestration in products, the calculation involves looking at the wood harvested, it, you know, what the product is, and then the conversion, like the, the byproducts or the waste associated with the uh, conversion process, the manufacturing process, and then the half-life of wood in use. Also, when we look at these alternatives, 
it's important to consider um, where the carbon in harvested wood ends up. Whether, and, and so there's these four different categories that research looks at. The product stain and use, such as a two by four in a building or something like that. Carbon also is very effectively stored in landfills. Uh, decomposition in landfills is greatly uh, slowed. And so that is a, a, a carbon storage mechanism is to put, put it in landfills. Uh, carbon can also end up uh, emitted uh, through combustion uh, with energy capture in a bioenergy se setting or without energy capture. So those are the things that we look at. Next slide, please. And so this is one of the charts that's available in the research where you can look at what type of material uh, the wood might be used for and then the half-life, the time in which um, that, would, that would remain in use over time. And so you can look at the far right, it's estimated that for paper, by year 31, all of the carbon in paper has generally been em emitted by, based upon the analysis of what's out there. We all know that some books end up stored for a very long time in the Library of Congress and other things, but that is obviously the exception, not the rule. And if we look just to the left of that, you're looking at kind of miscellaneous products and that you can see that you know, over, I mean, the, the, um, the, the rate of those uh, types of products is uh, pretty rapid. And to the further left of that, I mean, if small diameter materials aren't used for, used for biomass energy, um, paper is a possibility in some situations, so you could compare it to that. I think it is a bit more likely that um, mulch and compost are where we're really seeing, especially some of the waste wood, uh, urban wood materials go, and, and they start to decompose uh, almost immediately. We have, in the past, uh, residuals from sawmills, shavings, and these types of things have gone into animal bedding as a predominant market. And again, they uh, start to decompose and emit pretty quickly. Um, so next slide, please. And this is just the second to the last slide and, and we'll be done. Um, this is, I, I will not spend a great deal of time on this. I think the introduction from the secretary spoke to this well in terms of the existing policy framework within Maryland um, to address sustainable forestry, protecting forest resources, incentivizing replanting and regrowing of trees. So the white paper does touch on this, um, but in general there is a policy platform uh, to build on and ensure that woody biomass harvesting would continue to protect the forest resources of Maryland. Next slide please. So at the end of the day these are the major conclusions from the white paper. Uh, certainly all energy systems have impacts and trade-offs. There's no getting away from that. So you really have to look at what you, the status quo and, and the alternative that you're moving toward and base your comparison upon those types of uh, trade-offs. And then uh, we know that bioenergy from thermal or electric energy production, they're important strategies for reducing the dependence on fossil fuels. As was mentioned in the beginning, this is, there's a track record of this pretty well established. Uh, in Scandinavia, other parts of Europe, and, and we're starting to see um, increasing. I know some of the other speakers will speak well to the experience that we see in the Northeastern US around these, these benefits and, and opportunity to move away from fossil fuels. It's, and it may be surprising, um, but I think it, it, it's really um, reassuring that positive relationship between strong markets uh, for forest products and the opportunity to keep forests as forests, that we're really starting to see strong evidence of that. And that's really important as we try and meet many different uh, environmental, economic, and social goals uh, that rely upon keeping forests as forests. And forest income potential as a way to deter forest conversion. Uh, and this use of these low value materials in highly efficient uh, best technologies as a way to get the greatest benefit. Also avoiding more harmful pollutants and emissions and as I mentioned just lastly, building upon the existing policies to ensure that forest protections are, are considered in Maryland. With that, I, I wrap up and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to contribute to the, the white paper production. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for your presentation. I also want to thank you for the work of Dovetail Partners on the white paper and I want to remind those that are a part of the webinar series that that white paper is available online, posted at the same website where you registered for this program, and uh, it will be made available in other forms from various partners of the project uh, very shortly uh, during the webinar series. 
Let's move on in our webinar program because Katie's provided the opportunity to talk about practical examples of where biomass energy is being utilized. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Moira Adams, who's the program director for the Northern Forest Center in the Northeastern part of the United States. She's been working on innovative wood energy heating programs to the benefit of communities in the northern forests of Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and New York. The center itself is a regional innovator and investment partner in creating rural vibrancy and helping connect people and the economy, as Katie's pointed out, to their forested landscape. Mara has also contributed to the center's community revitalization programs and worked previously in the green building industry and in campus green programs. She's a graduate of the University of Wisconsin and the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and she lives in New Hampshire. Myra, we're pleased to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you. Um, you can go to the next slide. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to join the webinar. I was really looking forward to coming down to Maryland and joining you in person and getting to have some um, more extensive conversations about what we're doing up here in New England. But, uh, this will this will have to do. So um, I am very happy to talk with anyone on this webinar after the fact um, by email or, or take a call just to give more um, direct uh, answer direct questions directly or tell you more about our experience here. But for now, um, uh, yeah, I was asked to join this webinar to talk more about what's happening in the in northern New England. The Northern Forest Center has been working in this space for about 10 years. Next slide. We work across most of the state of Maine, northern New Hampshire, northern Vermont, and um, the Adirondacks in New York. This is a very significant area and um, with a lot of ecological similarities and economic similarities. And we invest in communities, support forest-based businesses, help create community forests, foster regional collaboration and leadership, basically try to bring resources to the region that helps diversify its economy and bring new life back to these um, rural communities. So this is just a map showing a lot of our, the different projects we have um, in, in the Northern Forest, just to give an indication of where we are. And um, this map I believe is on our website if you wanted to get a closer up look. Um, next slide. We see a tremendous opportunity for wood heat in the northern forest and in, in the northeast more broadly. And that's a, sort of a two-part um, reason for that. One is that we're very heavily forested. If you look at the um, map on the right, we have some of the most heavily forested states in the country. And the um, our wood basket is tremendous. There's a long history of um, a forest economy from northern New England and New York, uh, traditionally based on pulp and paper, and that's needing to rapidly change. And that's one of the reasons that we are promoting wood heat so much is that as those markets decline, we need different uses for that low-grade wood, as Catherine talked about. Um, but the other thing that's really essential to think about at why this wood heat is such a good opportunity in the Northeast is that we're heavily, heavily dependent on heating oil that there's not natural gas lines in most rural areas. I think the, the Northeast uses something like 80% of the country's heating oil. And we really think a lot and believe in having um, renewable energy solutions that make sense for place. And in some parts of the country that don't have a lot of wood, um, that do have alternatives, perhaps other renewable solutions make more sense. But in this area, looking to the forest to, as a substitute to fossil fuels, imported fossil fuels, makes a ton of sense. Where you have the need, you need to get off that heating oil, and you have the wood basket right there. It's a really important match. Next slide. So the way we position um, the argument for wood heat is really on that um, comparison to oil, that it makes the most sense. So looking at those those different reasons for it. And Catherine went over a bunch of these, so I don't need to belabor them. But we look at um, volatile pricing of oil versus wood heat. This is for wood pellets. And 
as we know, that oil prices are very volatile. But if you look at a five-year average, it's about a 30% savings when switching from foreign sources to community development, where you're keeping your heating dollars in the community. From fracking and oil spills to forward forest stewardship. I mean, a log job is, might, if looking at it might seem intrusive, but that is nothing compared to the environmental, um, the, the permanent environmental destruction that comes with fracking and oil spills that might not happen in our backyard, but is entirely more um, problematic long term. From pipelines and refineries to local, um, to the local wood basket again, um, local wood mills, from money flowing out of the region to job growth here at home. 78% um, of every dollar spent on heating oil goes out of the region entirely versus about 100% staying here when we heat with wood. And finally, I'll talk about this a little more in a minute, but um, when you look at greenhouse gas emissions, we're looking at an over 50% reduction from day one when you're switching from heating oil or other fossil fuels to wood heat in the northern forest. And again, as has been said, as Catherine said really well, there's not an ideal renewable, there's no ideal way to heat and power our buildings and our systems, that there's always going to be a consequence. And when you look at a renewable heating option that has so many different benefits, including that carbon benefit, it really does need to be part of the renewable energy solution that yes, electrification is great in many instances, but this needs to be part of the solution and it applies really well in a lot of different types of buildings as we'll see. Next. So just to be clear about what we're talking about, at the Northern Forest Center, we have really supported um, what we call modern wood heat. So systems that meet really high efficiency standards um, that have been the, the subject of extensive research and development, especially in Europe, where they have been heating with um, more modern forms of wood for a long time. And there's systems for every scale. So sometimes I'll talk to people who think of wood heat and just think about the old wood stove at grandpa's. And that is definitely not uh, what we are talking about. We are advancing the most efficient, the most um, environmentally uh, responsible systems possible. So this is just a, an example. It's a cutaway of an automated wood pellet boiler. Um, but there's uh, really um, efficient options at every scale of wood heat, from very efficient stoves to pellet stoves to pellet boilers and on up through major chip systems. But I wanted to make that distinction because especially looking at, um, you know, some people think about, well, what about cordwood? What about promoting heating with cordwood stoves? Well, there's plenty of people that heat with cordwood. I heat with cordwood, but that doesn't need the kind of promotion and incentives that other systems do. And um, as we'll get into state policies, those states are really interested in advancing new technology and um, getting the most efficient equipment out in the marketplace that they can. Next. So as I said, there's a lot of different policies that are being used in the Northeast to support this market. Um, the Northern Forest Center, um, one of the things we've done uh, is provide incentives on top of the things of the incentives that um, states are offering. So we did something that we called the Model Neighborhood Project, where we provided a lot of um, community education and um, tours, workshops, et cetera, and extra incentives for people in individual communities so that neighbors would start getting these systems in their homes and businesses, start talking about it. The pellet delivery truck would be seen in town and you'd get some buzz going. So that we did that program in several different communities across the Northern Forest from about 2011 to 16. And we've been tracking the impact of those installations over time, how much they've, they've contributed millions of dollars to the local economy at this point, and most importantly, perhaps creating really good demonstrations on the ground of what these look like. But those incentives really are needed. So for the advanced wood heating equipment, they're not cheap. And they're not cheap and people aren't terribly familiar with them. So between those two things, it can take um, 
a little more to uh, make the case than it might for other types of equipment. So all the northern forest states in Massachusetts um, offer rebates. The amount, the equipment type, and the eligible projects vary. So some have money for pellet stoves, some don't. Some have money for commercial systems, some don't. So you need to pay attention to what's available in each state. But as one example, the New Hampshire rebate currently is um, for it's 40% to a maximum of $8,000 for a residential automated wood pellet boiler, 40% to $65,000 for commercial. And um, just that picture uh, um, below is of a woman in Farmington, Maine, who was really, really happy to put an automated wood pellet boiler in her um, home, which doubles as a massage studio. And she said, as a masseuse, I, I basically do laundry for a living. And having a system that can uh, give me hot water and heat my home is incredibly helpful. So that she was, this was taken on one of the tours that we did to show local leaders um, and just interested parties what was available and what people were doing by way of modern wood heat in that community. Next. So another policy that's in some states are thermal renewable energy credits. And I'm delighted to hear from Catherine that this is available in Maryland as well. So I don't need to talk a lot about that. But um, the main, uh, the, the primary important piece here is that it makes projects more economically attractive by giving them a stream of income um, as long as for the whole project's life. And um, just here is an example of um, one school installation, the um, chip storage area. And this heats the chips stored here, um, power of five, 5 million BTU boiler that heats 250,000 square feet across four buildings. They have a district system. There are many, many, many schools in the northern forest states that are heated with wood. Something like 50% or more of Vermont students attend a wood heated school, um, which is just a really neat way to, to look at how wood heat can serve community needs. Um, in many places, it's the kids' parents who are um, the foresters or the loggers or the working in the pellet mill. And for those kids to be heated with that um, resource is really neat. Next slide. So another thing some of the states have done is invest in directly in the supply chain. So if you're delivering pellets in bulk, um, it's, you need specialized trucks, ideally, um, with a, a weight meter on board that can, um, so you know exactly how much you're getting and exactly how much to pay. These are expensive um, investments, and especially in this early stage of market development, you might not have, a, you know, a big cluster of um, deliveries in one area. So you might have to go here and then drive 50 miles to the next delivery and then drive 30 miles to the next one before you get to, before you um, deliver everything. So it's as we get from to a model where there's more installations and more deliveries to be had and it becomes more economical, it's really important that um, these policies and supports can step in and fill that gap and help offset the cost of those um, of that initial infrastructure. Also addressing that same problem, um, another investment in the supply chain was in, um, there's been a few of these where a state put funding toward a pellet depot essentially. So there's the pellet mill where the truck would normally fill up, but then there's also a, a depot, a holding place somewhere else in that state where they, the truck can go back just to there and refill instead of going all the way back to the mill. So that's another way that states have um, decided that this is really um, a, it's an economic opportunity worth investing in and are seeing the rewards as individuals and communities save money, spend that money locally, et cetera. Next. So um, we encounter a lot of um, questions, of course, about the environmental impact of heating with wood, and Catherine did a nice job of um, setting this out as well, and I encourage you all to read the white paper and, and check that out. We wanted to look at exactly the exact impacts of what, what it means from for switching from heating oil or other fossil fuels to wood pellets made in the northern forest. 
And this was a life cycle analysis that we, by an independent group, that we um, surveyed nine of the 10 pellet mills in the Northern Forest for all kinds of information about their, um, their fuel stock, what they, how far they're transporting the, the um, feedstock, what they're using to power the pellet mills, et cetera. And based on that, we, we found that um, from day one, essentially, as soon as you switch from heating oil, you're cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 54%. And that just goes up um, over the lifetime of that system as trees, as the trees grow back and start sequestering more carbon. So this has been a really, really important um, tool and resource for us to use as we talk more about this with, with folks. Next, please. And another, I won't go into this at all, I'll move on because Catherine uh, talked about it better than I did, just about how um, the harvests are integrated and it does not make any financial sense to cut wood just for biomass, that it's part of a bigger um, integrated picture. Next. So the, the most recent thing that we've been doing at the center to promote automated wood heat and wood heat more generally is a campaign that we developed in partnership with several dozen stakeholders called Feel Good Heat, where we're increasing awareness of automated wood heating systems, those um, central wood pellet boilers. And also, um, we've raised funds more recently that we're going to be rolling out a broader and deeper campaign about different forms of wood heat. But what we're trying to do here is, um, as I said, raise awareness, show people where this is um, present in their communities. You can see solar panels on a roof, but you can't see a pellet boiler in the basement. So how can we get these graphics and messages out um, on social media, in, in people's yards, obviously, make this a more um, tangible, vis visible movement, sort of, that people are stoked about as the tagline. Um, I encourage you to go to feelgoodheat.com. We have um, a really nice animation there that shows the journey of the pellet from a forest to the home. And um, we've been, really happy to have these assets to use. And if you contact me, I'd be happy to send you some, some of those assets in the mail. Next. And sort of as uh, along with the Feel Good Heat campaign, we wanted to profile some of the people that we have worked with over the years and who are heating with wood and show what are their values, what's motivating them to do this. So. I am very much not a technical um, engineer type person. I come at this subject from um, my interest in seeing how wood heat and how transforming the energy economy can help individuals and help communities. And so seeing these stories, I find really um, important and meaningful. This is Angela and John Harvey. They own a bike shop in Norway, Maine, and find that automated wood heat is super convenient for their business and they love to talk about it and love to take people down in the basement and show them the pellet boiler down there. Next. This is um, a staff person from a, an affordable housing group in Vermont. They, many, many of their properties are heated with wood. That's actually something we've seen pretty commonly in Vermont and New Hampshire where um, different affordable housing units, whether it's a, a there's a large um, renovated school that's now um, senior housing in New Hampshire. There's um, brand new um, developments where it's a mini district. So that's a very common application for, or a, a sector I would say that has um, caught on to wood heat as a really good uh, option that stabilizes costs and um, brings business to the back to, as she says, um, feeling good about keeping dollars in Vermont and forests as forests. Next slide. So this is Gary Collins. He is the facilities director at the Montshire Museum in Norwich, Vermont. It's a natural history museum and very consistent with their message about um, wanting to support environmental stewardship and the local community. So they're really happy with how much more efficient and um, cost effective this system is now. Next slide. So this is just an example. This is one of 
the very, very first people who put in a system through our model neighborhood project in Berlin, New Hampshire, which now we are pretty sure has the greatest concentration of wood pellet boilers in the country. Um, so Peter is, he's just great. He's been incredibly um, eager to show off his system to neighbors and talk about it. Uh, all to anybody who will listen and in, in his quote he wants you to know i'm an old hippie i love that i'm not bringing new carbon into the world that's huge to me which i love next slide so this is just in conclusion um this is at the burke town school in uh burke vermont where obviously that's their pellet silo and <clears throat> their wood pellet boilers it's a tandem system heats their little complex of buildings and this is one place especially where the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont is really economically challenged and um, has a really struggling uh, forest products industry with a lot of closures, not just in the Northeast Kingdom, but as far away as Maine, where people would had, had been sending their, their forest products. And to be able to bring wood heat to a community like this and um, help these kids be very excited about their new pilot boiler was well, really meaningful to us and um, I think a great example of how wood heat can bring some positivity and environmental stewardship to communities in rural areas. So that's all I have for now and I'm um, happy to answer questions later or um, independently after the webinar today. Thank you very much Mara. Really appreciate your sharing those interesting practical and local examples from the northeastern part of the United States about how wood energy is contributing to the renewable portfolio of those communities. Thank you very much for that uh, information. I'm sure that'll generate a lot of questions about the experience you and the center have had. Let's move on in our program uh, to our last presentation to help appreciate the environmental perspective on some of the issues and opportunities that our webinar series addresses. And to help us uh, address some of those questions, we've invited Josh Kirsch, who's the Director of Policy and Government Relations for the Maryland DC chapter of the Nature Conservancy. Josh works on policy and funding initiatives here in Maryland, works with the Maryland General Assembly, the DC Council, and of course our federal team uh, in Washington uh, on climate resilience, clean water, land conservation, and of course, on forestry issues. He works uh, with a wide variety of folks. I've had the opportunity to work with Josh a couple times this past year, including just recently on a prospective forestry initiative in the coming Maryland General Assembly. Josh got his master's degree from George Mason University and focuses on governance structures to tackle climate change, to show you the unique focus that education programs take these days. Josh, we're very pleased to have you with us today and look forward to your presentation. Welcome. Thanks a lot, Gary. I'm really happy to be here with uh, everybody today. Um, I'm also, uh, this is my second call with Gary in two days, and I will say, uh, after yesterday, I saw your background, I tried to come up with a good one, but for some reason, I think maybe the multi tones of paint were not allowing me to put something nearly as good in place. But so next time we're on a call, Gary, I'm going to have a better background for you. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to be here today, really at the beginning of this seminar series. And uh, what I want to do in this, uh, this time is really bring the perspective of the Nature Conservancy and share some of the ways that we evaluate and think about biomass energy. So I'm Josh, as, as Gary said, I'm the head of our policy and government relations team for the Maryland DC chapter. Uh, the Conservancy is a global organization. We're in 79 countries and here in the US we have a physical location. We touch down do work in every single state. And so I work with our Maryland DC chapter on the work that we do um, here in Maryland. And across the world, we're really working on protecting land and water from a range of different threats with climate change really being the largest one. Here in Maryland, we're working to protect lands across the state, improve forest health, increase community resilience to climate change and improve water quality. Um, so I just wanna note, uh, this slide says environmental perspective. Um, I think it's an environmental perspective. Uh, you know, as we're kind of talking about today, there's different values, different values and different trade-offs associated with biomass. And that really does vary um, in the environmental community as well. So I want to discuss kind of our vision for Maryland forests, unpack some of the threats, and discuss how biomass can and sometimes can't play a role in that vision here in Maryland. Um, 
So as, as Gary had said in, in his in, in, uh, intro, we're gonna talk about trade-offs and, and really we're gonna talk about finding balance. So I just wanna start with highlighting some of the impacts we're seeing here in Maryland um, from climate change in the forest space. So we, we're seeing things like the increase of pests and pathogens, impacts to different native species, with changes in precipitation. Um, we're really continuing to see a, a strain on our forest health um, further than you know, the, the issues that we've already had. We care about forests for so many of the great benefits they provide. You know, uh, Secretary Hathaway Riccio talked about how important forests are for meeting our clean water goals, our climate change goals, our habitat goals, our recreation goals. I mean, you can kind of go down and tick the boxes of all the ways that forests are really important to people and to nature. So addressing climate change and those associated impacts through forest health really requires all the tools at our disposal. And the Conservancy believes that there's a role for woody biomass um, when used at the proper scale um, to, to really help improve and increase the health of our forests and help us tackle climate change. So forests have a multitude of benefits, as I, as I mentioned, um, and really that fits with a multitude of different, a diversity of values that people put on our forests. So our, our vision for Maryland's forests is really to optimize these benefits. So forest reserves that prioritize needs of nature, right? Really important, robust areas where we have strong ecosystems. Places where we have working forests that provide revenue, but also habitat. The importance that uh, forests play in the stream buffer area and supporting our clean water goals. There's a, there is room and a need for the diversity of the values that people hold for forests within the conversation around biomass and about managing our forests moving forward. So one of the many critical roles that forests have played in Maryland is sequestering and storing, and storing carbon. You know, all forests, young, old, publicly held, privately held, reserves, working lands, they all contribute to this goal of sequestering for carbon. And really, the healthier the forest, the more sustainably managed the forest, the better we're gonna do at increasing those climate benefits and, and the sequestration components. Okay. So when I'm talking about biomass uh, at the Nature Conservancy, we talk about it from three kind of perspectives. So one, where the wood comes from, what, where it's used, and how it's used. And so, whether the wood comes from really is talking about sustainable harvest. And sustainable harvest, I know, means a lot of things to different people. Um, I think some people frame it kind of as what it isn't. So for us, it's not clearing land for development. It's not clearing high value public lands that have high conservation value. But it is harvesting areas where we have existing best management practices that are implemented and enforced and working through kind of certified sustainable forest management plans to make sure that the, the, the harvest is sustainable. When I talk about where it's used, we're looking at the local context. So what are the existing potential air quality issues? What are the existing forest health? What are the, the, the existing context of that, the energy resources? So you heard Maura talk about today how uh, biomass can help offset things like fuel oil, which have much greater impacts on, our, um, on, on climate change and, and on, our, on our ecosystems. So when we talk about what it is at the Nature Conservancy, we're really looking for the most efficient uses. Um, as Maura just talked about, you know, seeing that in heat uh, production or thermal production and really those combined heat power systems were really driving and maximizing that efficiency. And that's really important for several of the reasons, several reasons, which I'm going to get into here in a little bit. So a strong, so kind of want to take a step and think about, okay, what are the co-benefits? Like why is biomass why does that align with our vision for forests? So a strong forest products economy can help private landowners really keep their forests as forests across Maryland and the central apps. You know, thinking about wood energy and the waste residues, the, the low value timber, and how those things can really support the forest products industry and support these local economies. And really, again, ensure that we have foresters on the ground and that we're keeping forests in forests and we're helping people manage them as sustainably as possible. It has rural economy value, right? I mean, we just saw that in Mora's presentation. It also allows folks to connect. You know, I think the, the, the old hippie quote kind of makes this point for me, but that locally, for, locally harvested wood going towards local heat production, local energy production, and really, again, highlighting the importance of our forests and maintaining our forests and our forest health. 
A lot of our forests are in poor conditions and that's due to a legacy of different issues, past management, I mean, current threats, things like pests and pathogens, climate change um, as well. And sometimes timber harvest can be part of that forest restoration plan. And so having a low a market for some of these lower grade, lower value wood products really can help fund restorative practices and restorative management um, and really make them economically feasible for private landowners. We also recognize that without a, a market for these low grade woods, um, or wood grade, low grade wood products, the landowners have a stronger incentive to sell their largest, their oldest trees in their forest, um, which can really degrade the ecological function and contribute to water quality issues and, and kind of do the opposite of, of what forests can do to help us meet our goals as a state. Um, it also can provide that, that, really that revenue stream for these, these local products and drive that better management. So when we're talking about potential issues around biomass, you know, one, one thing we do talk about is how, when done at improper scales, this can exacerbate climate change. And I think one thing that all of the, the, the panelists today have really reinforced is the importance of understanding the life cycle of carbon, doing a real life, a detailed life cycle analysis of that carbon, not just thinking about what it's released when it's combusted. And I think the, the, the dovetail paper or white paper really does highlight that, you know, looking at where the emissions are come from, from production, from transportation, things along those lines. And when we're looking at policies and for programs that are going to incentivize these things, really taking that into consideration, you know, we need to minimize transportation. These things have an impact. They are cumulatively, they very much matter. The other thing we need to think about is air quality for people and for nature, you know, both indoor and outdoor air quality. And really what we see and, and was mentioned in, in Maura's presentation was these really efficient, uh, the, and the, the research shows these efficient types, these efficient new innovative technologies actually drive down some of the, the air quality impacts that we can see from these. And again, still better than what we would see from some of the heating oils. And so being able to transition from that gives us some of these climate and air quality benefits, but it's really important to take into consideration what's going on locally, where we have areas of low air quality and take that into consideration when we're putting policies and plans in place. Other things related to, I think some of the, the less innovative pieces of technology, we could potentially have impacts to water um, from cooling systems. So then we're introducing warmer water to these cool ponds, you know, as a uh, Trout fishermen know that's not something that we want to do to really have sustainable and, and really uh, important waterways be, be healthy as well. The other thing too is, you know, when we think about this, there is, a, as we've discussed and heard about, really a, a robust market in Europe and in other places. And we want to make sure that when we're, when we're thinking about these policies in Maryland, we're not trying to get into kind of competition with these bigger markets where we're then kind of driving and, and outstripping the, the ability that we can have to put together a robust and sustainable um, program or set of policies. And then the other thing is just really keeping in, in mind the fact that we have these kind of compounding threats across the forest landscape that we're dealing with now. And that really is, you know, pests and pathogens. We're seeing the hemlock woolly adelgids. You know, there's, there are these other threats that really need to be considered, looking at development patterns, things like that. So really taking that local context into consideration when we're building policies and programs. So one of the ways that um, we've tried to think about how we can build success is really coming up with principles uh, around biomass that we can all work towards. And I know Mauro participated in this with the Nature Conservancy. Or there's a, a wide range of partners that were involved, but really thinking about what principles we need to be successful. And you know, we, we landed on these generally as kind of avoiding minimizing and if necessary, mitigating any impacts to forests and streams, ensuring that we have sustainable harvest as I touched on before, full carbon accounting, uh, full life cycle carbon accounting, considering the siting of these facilities, both their fuel source and, um, you know, the need to minimize transportation due to climate emissions from, from the transportation sector and, and other uh, associated issues with that. Really using technologies such as dry cooling that avoid or minimize impacts to rivers that are caused by traditional evaporative cooling, and really recognize that both public and private conservation lands, um, they've been protected to safeguard a range of public benefits. And many of these lands would, would not be appropriate for biomass facilities because of the role that they're already playing in the state. So again, you know, our vision in Maryland is to, to optimize those multitude of benefits that people get 
across the gamut of where forests lie and make sure that we are ensuring the, the sustainable continued growth of our forests and the ability for our forests to really provide so many of the critical things that we need as people in nature to thrive. Um, so that's a, a bit of a framing around how we think about uh, biomass energy uh, here at the Nature Conservancy and how we think about our forests. Um, again, I'm really happy to have been a part of this, this seminar. I'm looking forward to seeing the work that you all do and being a part of that as we're moving into the other um, presentations. So thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. I really appreciate your comments and particularly your concluding remarks about a framework within which to review some of the larger issues concerning the use of biomass energy. And I hope that you'll take the time to maybe write those up so we can post those on the website and share those more broadly for those who don't take the time to listen to this. I'd like to use that uh, those it, the framework as an opportunity to make sure we draw out our future presenters on these questions for the net coming webinars. I think that'd be a good framework with which to approach some of the questions that are happening. For those of you who have joined us, I really want to thank you for being a part of it. And as we prepare for the brief time we have left on question and answers, I want to take a moment for you to answer uh, the following polling questions, particularly in light of the presentations we've made here today. Has today's session impacted your thoughts about biomass energy? Uh, perhaps broaden your perspective, raise questions, confirm your opinion, challenge your assumptions, inspire new ideas. And by the way, I hope you'll use the chat function uh, to share some of those observations with us because we're anxious to follow up on uh, your perspectives because the whole benefit of this webinar series is for us to learn together about each other's perspectives and the challenges that biomass energy needs to address if we're to make it a part of Maryland's clean energy future. We can't do that unless we're in dialogue with each other, which is the sole and principal purpose of these particular webinars, to create the conditions for that dialogue. Thank you very much for the response that I see so many of you have provided. That's excellent. Now, if I could just get this thing to advance. Let's look at some of the questions. I noticed that a couple of the questions that at least I've seen posted are about the white paper. And since we've spent some resources to help develop it, I wanted to ask Katie if she would spend just a minute talking about the issue about whether or not the white paper has any bias built into it about the perspectives and use of biomass energy from a particular region. Uh, there are those who think that uh, the experience of other areas may not be as applicable to Maryland as we would like, in contrast to what I would like Maura to talk about, about whether or not she thinks that experience in the northeastern part is relevant. So in terms of the white paper, do you think that there are any particular biases that the research represents that kind of uh, in the white paper? Oh, thank you, Gary. And um, Monique, or if, if anyone wants to turn on my video and try it, please feel free. Um, but, I, you know, in, I, I would say no, there isn't any particular bias toward, um, you know, anything like that. Certainly the white paper is limited by the available research. Um, but within that research, many different scenarios are examined, uh, some of which, are, uh, of course, are I, I would say are relevant to Maryland. So, uh, no inherent intention to be biased, certainly have to just reflect what's available in the research. And Maura, how do you, do you think the examples that you've encountered in the northeastern part of the United States are replicable here in Maryland? Is there any issues or challenges you see that we should be aware of that might uh, prevent uh, the applicability of or transfer of some of that technology to our area? Um, yeah, thanks. I think you just need to look at um, where is your wood coming from and how much is there and how much can continue to be used without um, adding problematic harvesting um, on your lands. But it sounds like there is plenty of wood available. Um, and But I, I would look at what is that resource? What is your feedstock resource? And um, because we do want this to be a reasonably local or regional solution. Um, 
And, you know, we focus on switching people from heating oil. You can absolutely switch from natural gas or any other heating source. It's more economically appealing when you're switching from uh, heating oil or propane, but um, if you can absolutely make the environmental and social and community case for heating with wood in any situation. It just may be um, more of a values-based and climate case than the economic one if you are switching from a lower cost fuel, which it may be more common in, um, in, more, or in more developed areas. Moira, both you and Katie and Josh all referred to the climate change impacts of biomass and forest harvest. Do any one of you have a specific comment about the carbon neutrality question of the use of biomass energy? Because there's been a long discussion about whether or not it has either short-term or long-term impacts on forests. Uh, and their use for biomass energy. I'd appreciate any perspective you'd like to provide on that since we've received several questions about the issue of carbon neutrality. Yeah, I can, I can try first, but I'd love to hear what Katie and Josh say as well. Um, yeah, there are um, a number of people who argue that um, using wood for energy is carbon neutral. I think that it's one, one of the most um, vocal about this in our area, he argues very staunchly, it's carbon neutral, carbon neutral, and then if you push him, oh, until the point of combustion. Well, we can't look at until the point of combustion because we combust it. You have to look at all those impacts, but this is going to be always a situational question. So when there's any claim that, oh, wood energy is carbon neutral, it's overly simplistic and we need to take a, a closer and more um, realistic look at what is the carbon impact and not just um, try to argue, I think, wrongly that, oh, there's no carbon impact, just don't worry about it. It's a lot more complicated than that. And so I'm always wary of um, simplistic answers to something that's incredibly complex. So Josh or Katie, do you want to give your take? I'll, I'll chime in just a little bit. I, com I completely agree with that. It, it's a simplistic to, to pretend it's just yes or no answer is simplistic. Um, but I would say that in the absence of a truly elegant solution, it's also harmful to um, put a carbon accounting burden on renewable energy sources that we haven't found a way to equally uh, apply to other energy sources. So, so if that makes sense, and that's why I think when you look at um, some of the, the international uh, panel on climate change and some of these other bodies that have wrestled with it, with it uh, in many instances, the fallback is to a carbon neutrality position because the alternative is not yet sufficient and elegant enough to not create unintended negative uh, consequences and disadvantages to renewable energy systems. So I agree. Uh, it's, it's, you can't ignore the reality of uh, emissions that are associated with bioenergy, um, but we really need better policy solutions or we end up defaulting to the status quo if we don't uh, recognize the uniqueness of renewable woody biomass energy systems. Josh, you want to add any comment to that uh, carbon neutrality question? Yeah, and I, I think, um, I think it, it also comes back to the, you know, how we're accounting for the carbon impacts, right? And, and including full life cycle analysis, you know, like, like was done in, in the dovetail white paper um, so that we can make these, these have these conversations about the trade-offs that are implied in any of the, the policies or programs, you know, that would be informed by those, those, um, those decisions. So, or, or those pieces of research. So I do think it's, it's about, you know, continuing to push for the, the best science and, and um, data around that so that we have the, the strongest understanding of the, the, the lack of or the carbon neutrality um, for the decisions that we're going to make and the trade-offs that, that are associated with any decision that we're making in the climate space, especially um, when it comes with mitigation and, and energy, like, you know, in heating. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Madam Secretary, I see you're still with us. I want to thank you very much uh, for your uh, participation throughout the length of the webinar. One of the things that you mentioned was the economic adjustment strategy and the current ongoing work that is looking at the role of 
uh, the forest community and Maryland's economic future. Can you provide any additional information about the timeline when the information from that study might be more widely available? Sure, thank you for the question. And I'm, I'm happy to report that our partners have been working very diligently and very quickly with us. Um, we are hoping to have the entire process wrapped up within a year. And I wanna just emphasize that um, it, it is not just a report, it is actually a strategy. So there will be um, tangible uh, recommendations that we'll be able to implement in Maryland to um, try to enhance our, our markets and support our forestry industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Friends, we've reached the end of our time today and I wanna stress that any questions we haven't attended to in the webinar will be addressed online and in writing. So for those of you who ask a question that we didn't get to, I hope you'll come back to the website in a day or two and we'll provide response from our presenters or some of the project folks that are involved. And since we've reached the time, I wanna thank our guest speakers for and your attention of the attendees for your participation today. And as you exit, I hope you'll open the survey page on your browser and submit a form to ensure that you have, we have the correct information about the continuing education credits you might want, any additional updates to contact information for you, or whether or not you'd need additional assistance or have other questions that you'd like to provide us that uh, this seminar is raised in your own mind. We hope that you'll be able to join us for the future sessions of this webinar series, and you'll find listed on your screen at the present time the series and the dates and uh, that are coming up. Again, I wanna thank you very much for the time that you've taken to join us today. And recall that the white paper that we've paid some attention to today is available on the website. And I wanna again, thank you for your time and attention for today's webinar.